this is odd for me. It's uh, different, I know, because of what we're all going through with the coronavirus and all the things that's going on in the world. But I miss Sunday school so bad. I miss teaching Sunday school so bad. I talked to the pastor, and I really wanted to get started in, in, in trying to teach Sunday, class on, on, uh, Sunday school classes online. And, and my mind was going from one thing to the other. What should I teach? How should I teach? And God's been putting on my heart a lot of, uh, of things. And this lessons I'm going to be starting today, I do one about every week, is something the world needs to hear, especially Christian folks. Uh, because there's been a dispute uh, in a Christian faith over the years. There's been books written. There's been uh, talk shows and so-called experts get on there uh, kind of talking about the, the origin of the Christian faith, how it started and where it came from. Books have been written and all these things saying that Jesus was just a man or Jesus didn't even exist or, or Jesus never even said he was the son of a God. And, but yet, you stop and think, when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked a question, what is truth? And that's the question. That is a question for all ages, because we're getting into the environment where many people say, I know what the truth is, and what is truth? And we're going to be looking at something over the next few weeks that, that, that God has put on my heart. Oh, I want to look into church history how it started when Jesus stood before Pilate and asked the question, what is truth? He was standing before Pilate. He was a governor. He, he was the most powerful man in that area, a, a, a authority from Rome. And he was standing here face to face with the truth of all ages, the Christ. And he didn't see it. So what is truth? Today in our society and in our world and every place you find, people want to tell you, well, let me tell you what the truth is. And some of the books that's been written, some of the uh, uh, so-called books, especially 10 years ago, there's a particular book that comes on to my mind called uh, The Da Vinci Code, where he, he, he said, this is fact, this is truth. Jesus never said he was the son of a God. He said Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. They had a child, and they got married and had a family, and, and, and this has been known for years, the book says. It was the church that covered all this up. They said at the Council of Nicaea, a man called Constantine, uh, he, he colluded together with a bunch of these uh, church officials, and they decided themselves that Jesus was divine. They said the Gnostic Gospels were, were more truthful than the 27 books of the New Testament that we hold in truth today. He said that's what the truth is, and the bad part about it in the world that we face, people are listening to this, people are believing this, people are grasping this, and today, more than any other time in history that I can think of, Christian faith is being challenged. People will say, I have truth. You have truth. Everybody has a different truth. Uh, can I tell you something? Truth is truth, no matter who denies it. And a lie is a lie, no matter who believes it. Church history is what we're going to be looking at. It's been around for 2,000 years. I got of kind of chuckling the other day. I saw a cartoon somewhere where... Somebody went up and asked the person, do you know anything about church history? And, and the person says, yes. And, and in 1967, Pastor so-and-so came to the church, and that was the beginning of church history, <laughs> the church history for them. And sad to say, that's what a lot of Christians know. That's all they know is what they got saved, they got in the church, and all they know about what the time they got saved in the church and, uh, and how it started. But it started 2,000 years ago. It started at the time of Christ that our faith, our Christian faith started. I want to begin this evening, this morning, afternoon, whenever you're looking at it, <laughs> at a time called the age of Catholic Christianity. Now, that's going to blow your mind because... Uh, you got, uh, let, let me explain that to you. The word Catholic here is, is, is a small c. This, I'm not talking about the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic actually means universal. It means uh, uh, all together. Christians were Christians. That was it. There was no Protestants. There was no Catholics. There was no denominations. They were all 
Christians. That's all the word. And that's called the age of, of uh, Catholic Christianity. And that goes from about 70 A.D. up to about 320 A.D. And that's important. People said in, in, in uh, 312 A.D. that uh, uh, these writers and these people that wrote these books said in 312 A.D. is when the council got together, the Council of Nicaea and, and the Catholic Church and the Vatican all got together with Constantine. and They all clung together and, and they decided then that, to make Jesus divine. It was at that point also they decided that we're going to pick these 27 books of the Bible that became our New Testament. Now, you want to know the truth? The Catholic Church and the Vatican did not even exist in 312 A.D. You see, this is the stuff that the world is throwing at us. Catholic Christianity, I'm talking about not the Roman Catholic, but that, that time of, of solidarity and Christianity was from 70 A.D. to 312 A.D. And, and, and in that time, in 312, the, uh, the Roman emperor comes to Christ. His name is Constantine. That's phenomenal. That has never happened before. That, that's something unheard of that the Roman emperor become, comes to Christ. All the time before that, all the time before this time was from 312, Christians were being persecuted like crazy. Thousands upon thousands were being murdered and killed up till then, until 312. Then all of a sudden, at the Edict of Milan in 312 A.D., he issues an edict that says we are going to stop persecuting Christians. That's crazy. That's a total change, a total switch. But this, 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 this period of Christianity began in 70 A.D. It began with the fall of Jerusalem. It began when, when Titus' army came around uh, the, the, the walls of Jerusalem and breached the walls. They went in, they totally burned the city, destroyed the temple. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Jews didn't have any place to sacrifice. They didn't have any place to go to, to offer their sacrifices. The temple had been destroyed, and they were scattered. They were scattered out and pushed out of Jerusalem all over. For 2,000 years, Jews have been scattered throughout the world, wandering, waiting to, 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 to form a nation. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 26, 27, and 28, I think it is, says, God said this is going to happen to you. You're going to be pushed out. You're going to be left. But in May the 15th, 1947, Jews became a nation again. God told the prophet, a second time, I will bring you back into the land. So 70 A.D. till 312 A.D. till Constantine was saved. He makes a statement. He makes a declaration. He said, all people will become Christians. I want everybody to line up. Let's go down to the river. Let's all get baptized and let's all get saved. Now, you know you can, that's not the way you get saved, by making a declaration of government. Surely, I don't care who the president is who declares that we're all going to be so-and-so, and he makes a declaration that you're going to be saved. Salvation comes from the heart. It's individual. It's on us. This is one of the worst things that ever happened to Christianity. The early church, as began, there was a, a flaming evangelism when it first started in 70 A.D. Christianity began to spread. It spread from that little point in Jerusalem and began to spread, and it has spread all around the world. Have you ever stopped to think that Christianity always goes west, or the gospel always went west? Do you remember in Acts 16 when Paul, Paul was wanting to go over into Asia to, 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 on one of his missionary, uh, missionary trips to, to, to preach the gospel. And, and the Holy Spirit came to him and, and put a conviction. He had a dream about a, a Macedonian man telling him to preach, come and tell me about the gospel. And Paul went west instead of east. We know through the Testament and all the, uh, all the books that Paul wrote and all the epistles that we have Paul's ministry was always continuing west to Galatia, to Corinth, to uh, Thessalonica, Ephesus. All those cities to the left kept pushing west, kept pushing west, kept pushing west. 
finally ended up in Rome, and then later the gospel is also spread out even to Spain and then to Portugal. And in three or four hundred years, it comes to the land of England, to Scotland, to Ireland. Well, aren't you glad it came to your ancestors? My, you know I'm Irish. My, my, my uh, forefathers were probably on top of a mountain barking at the moon at the time this was going on. But God sent someone there. The gospel spread to that part of the world. Thank God for the gospel coming to my people. Then we get to the 15 and 16 hunters. It crosses the Atlantic Ocean. Comes to a new country. Lands at a place called Virginia Beach. It's uh, Charlestown Landing. Those people got off their ship they erected a cross for Christ. They got on their knees and they thanked God for bringing them to this country. They traveled on up the, Saint, uh, the, the James River, the James River to Williamsburg, which is known that today, and founded the first settlement in America. That is how America started. Started by Christian believers coming over and, and wanting to spread the gospel. And the gospel spread from there throughout the colonies and eventually started going west again and traveled west through the Appalachians to cross the Mississippi and on over across the Rocky Mountains to the west coast. Today, the gospel has crossed over the Pacific, has got into the, the, the Middle East and the East. They're having revivals in Korea. They're having revivals in India. Christianity is exploding to the west and it's going to continue, I believe, to the west until he gets back to Jerusalem and the Jews are going to come to know Christ and the end of time comes when our Lord comes back. But it starts in Jerusalem. It starts with the Jews. It starts with Stephen being stoned at Antioch. It starts with Barnabas and Paul and Timothy following God's call to go out into these countries and tell people about the new way, the new Christ, the new Savior. Christ came and died for your sins. And it was that way till about 60, 65 AD. And it covered the whole Roman Empire. The gospel did. So how did the gospel spread so fast? Number one, I think it was a Christian witness. Individuals, not some pompous pr uh, priest or, or some hierarchy of, of, of uh, religion, but it was just the individual that came to the truth that God loves them. Not the God of fear that you hear about in the Old Testament that you couldn't even look upon his face. And This was a God that loved them. This was a God that died for their sins. This was a God that set them free and set them free from a life of sin. This was something totally new and people were grasping that and following that. Number two was the transformation effect of the gospel. Families changed. Lives changed. Everything changed. People began to love each other. Jesus told them, by this all men shall know that you are my, my disciple." if you love one another. There was another emperor called Julian the Apostate. He was a relative of Constantine and, and he was raised in a Christian home. But he wanted to stamp out Christianity because Christianity was, was getting so widespread and popular and spreading so wild. He was concerned about that. The love for the people that they had, the caring for the people that they knew and how they cared for one another, even caring for one of those who died. It was affecting the culture all around that area during that time. Something's unbelievable. They said they care more for each other than they care for anything else in other kinds. It was an unbelievable thing, the transforming effect of the gospel to the culture of that time. And I think the third thing why the gospel spread so fast that anybody can come to Jesus. Anybody. In Paul's day, one-third of the population was slaves. Slaves, just property. 
Just something to be bought and sold, same as cattle or, or any type of livestock. No rights, no purple things at all. A third of the population. Also women. You see, up to this time, women were kind of oppressed. They couldn't do the things that men could do in the culture that they lived in. <laughs> the books that I've been talking about have been put out. They talk about how Christianity suppresses women. Well, if that's true, then I guess paganism exalts women. I, I, I will look into that later, probably. But the early church, it was made up of men. It was made up of slaves. It was made up of women. Why was that? Because it was the gospel. The gospel said, whosoever will come. John 3.16 is the gospel. And that was so simple and so obvious that everybody, regardless of their education, their culture, whatever the stance they had, who they were, could understand that God loves them. God died for them. Their sins have been paid. Whoever comes to him and accepts that will be saved. That was the gospel. Women, slaves, children, anybody could come to Christ. Number four, it probably had a transforming effect on society too. You see, Rome, <laughs> Rome had all kinds of, of, of gods. Every kind of god. They worshipped anything, they worshipped everything. That was the kind of God they had, the uh, religion that they had. And when the Christians came, the Christians said, no, there's one God. And there's one Savior. And that Savior forgives your sins. And whoever comes to him will be saved. Man, that transformed society that was going. Fifth, I think, another thing we need to look at is that Christians died well. In 9-11, leader of a terrorist group that flew the planes into the Twin Towers came from a broken home. The suicide bomber that went into London came from a broken home. Even the first kamikaze pilot clear back in World War II were from broken homes, and they, but they were young, they were educated. Here's what the, the, was going on in their lives. They would come to them and say, look, if you fly that plane into the towers, or if you take this bomb and you do this terror attack, we'll give you fam your family $25,000 from the PLO. And then we think that might get you to heaven. You know, the Quran can't even tell you for sure that you can go to heaven. Muhammad wasn't even sure on how to get to paradise. Folks, that's a big world of difference than the gospel and the early Christians' death, how they died. They died because they loved Jesus. They died because he loved them. It was a love affair. You only find that in the Bible. You can't find that anyplace else. That God loves you. Thousands of Christians over the, over the years were willing to go and die because they were in love with Jesus. And they knew that God loved them. Folks, that is a total world of difference. Polycarp. He was the leader of the church around 70 A.D. to about 155 A.D. They burned him at a stake. Yet these people who wrote these books and say that God, that God is the uh, uh, God is the never claimed to be God, that Jesus never claimed to be God, that all these things that uh, was all made up at this Council of Nicaea. Nobody believed that till 325 A.D. Well, what do you do about Polycarp? Polycarp wrote, Jesus is God in the flesh. They asked Polycarp, Oh man, you can live. 
if you just proclaim and say that Caesar is Lord? Polycarp answered, all these years, I have served him, and he's been faithful to me. How can I deny my Savior? He walked himself up to the wood, stood in the midst of the wood, and they burned him alive. That's how Christianity grew in the early church. I'll start another session following up because I'm getting into something still in the age of Catholic Christianity. Yes, that's cat, small c. That, that's, that's altogether church, not the Roman Catholic Church. But we'll start that uh, another session next week. And they're all going to be about the same length, probably 25 to 30 minutes, I think. Because I know most of you was in my Sunday school class, you were asleep in 20 minutes. So uh, I'll keep you up on that. But I just want to share with you before I uh, close the, this session today is that this world is in a mess with the coronavirus. We faced that and we went through so much of that. But also, too, in the, in the rioting and, and, and the protesting over the, over the death of, uh, of George Floyd and the, all the things that's going on from country to country and it's tearing our nation apart. I think today, in our world that we live in today, Christians can make a great impact on how we deal with this and how we go through this and how we react to all of this. Now, I know a lot of you are looking at me and say, well, Mackie was a police officer for 21 years. Yes, I was. And it, it breaks my heart to see the things I see on, on going on in TV today. All the years that I was a police officer, I never knew of one policeman who wanted to go out and kill someone. And most of them who did bear the scars till the day of that traumatic event that happened to them. Now, I'm not saying that every police officer is good. There's bad in everything. But on a general rule, where in the world will we be without them? That's just a thought. We need to keep one another in prayer. And also for the folks that's being oppressed and all the things that's going on, if the world needs Jesus, it's today. So I appreciate all the time you've given me today. I'll be back with you again next week, as Paul Harvey says, for the rest of the story.